Hey everybody, it's Pax. Um, today I'm going to walk through how to use the Tabletop Simulator mod and help answer some common questions I've seen asked in the community. Um, I've seen a lot of questions crop up lately about, you know, how do I use the mod? Can someone walk me through some of the basics? A lot of questions about things that I've come to understand personally as like very commonplace ways of manipulating tokens, stuff like that. So um, I guess before I get started, I'm going to go ahead into the uh, settings and change a bunch of things that might not seem super obvious. Uh, the first is going to be um, in the sound that this main menu volume is absolutely necessary to turn off. That is the most grating music I've ever heard in my life. So graphics, obviously, up to your personal taste. Um, I know that I clicked everything reset to default so that I could go change everything back to myself. One thing in particular in the controls that bothered me for a long time and I didn't realize what it was is this zoom toggle. I don't want this set on mouse 2. I want that set on nothing. So I clicked that and I pressed escape and it unbound that. And I might rebind it later to show you just how annoying it is, but trust me, it's a very frustrating uh, thing when you're trying to pan around using your middle mouse button. It would often zoom you in and zoom you out and it just wouldn't make any sense. Uh, I'm certain there are some other changes that I had made for myself at some point, but we won't do any here right now. I like to play on a dark theme personally for me, this is just a no-brainer. It looks so much cleaner to me, and it just hurts my eyes to play it otherwise. Uh, I usually turn chat off, but I won't be turning chat off because a lot of useful information is relayed through chat. There are also some additional miscellaneous settings. Hand view, um, hand minimize size. You can change how small your hand is when you're in there. Uh, but the one that I'm looking for is the one that controls how often you autosave. Now personally, I do not want to autosave at all, and I believe that this is currently set at zero because I have not reset this individually. The reason I have this at zero is because, for me at least on my computer, every however many, whatever the interval is, whenever it goes to autosave, um, it would just lag for like five or six seconds. And if you've got a nice high-end computer, that's probably not going to be a problem. But if you're hosting games, everyone in the game gets that lag. So, personally, I like to set that to zero, and I just deal with the fact that if my game crashes and we all get buggered out of a match, then I'm sorry, but that's it. <laughs> so, that's that. We'll go ahead and we create. I'm going to be playing single player here. If you want to play with your friends, you do multiplayer. You can put in a server name. You can put invite only. You can say friends, and you can put a password in. Um, which only available for public passwords, so you can, you know, do whatever you want. A maximum number of players, probably, you know, you don't have to set that to four if you want someone to be able to watch, but I'm going to be going with single player. I just downloaded the latest mod. You click that mod, you say load. This video is going to be assuming that you know where to get the mod. If you know, you know. If you don't know, you can ask. So we'll just load it up. Takes a while takes a lot less time than it used to. Now the big things that you're going to notice is that all of these things are like transparent. If you're familiar with the mod already and haven't seen it in a while, all these are transparent, all these are transparent. There's a whole bunch of extra stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and look at them from top left to bottom right. So first off, before we go any further, I do want to cover navigation. I'm holding my middle mouse button down and I'm dragging it. That's all I'm doing. I'm just dragging my mouse around with the middle mouse. You can change your angle by right clicking and then dragging it. So those are the two main ways that you're going to be like maneuvering your camera. So I, and then zooming in with the scroll wheel zooms you in, zooming out with the scroll wheel zooms you out. Those are basically the only mouse controls that I use. Um, dragging your mouse and clicking will select multiple things, but it will also let you manipulate most cards in the game. So. That's basically it for the mouse controls. Let's go into the level zero cards, which is this top right area. Each of the classes is listed up here. Build your deck, skills, events, assets. When you click the place button underneath each icon, it loads in and places every card at level zero from that class, including multi-class cards, such as this. I'm zooming in by pressing the alt button on a single card. And you can also scroll wheel to make these bigger. But they list them here. I believe they're in alphabetical order. 
They appear to be in alphabetical order with uh, the quotation marks at the start, obviously. Lovely stuff, that. And then when you're done with that class, you just click Recall. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about the Level 0 cards. Personally, and this is going to be generally applicable for the entire tutorial, when you place something, you don't want to go and move one of those things. I would like to copy, which you can do by right-clicking on a card and clicking the Copy button, or, if you hover over here on Copy, Control-C. You know, it's your normal um, hotkeys for copy-paste. Okay, so the next area is here, and this is our campaign boxes and community content and various tools that people have developed, as well as taboo cards, leaked items, Barkham Horror, a token reservoir, all the encounter sets, a bunch of legacy assets, all the rule books. They're all kind of hidden amongst some items here. The big thing to note is that a lot of the functionality up here of downloading these, these aren't starting preloaded anymore like they used to. If I want to play Knight of the Zealot, I click download here, the object's now loaded, and then I can click place. And what that does, down below the campaigns, it sets all of the scenarios up right here. It gives you your campaign log over on this side, over in the victory display. And then it puts your campaign, excuse me, your campaign guide over here, and it puts your campaign log over here. So that's kind of the basics of these. The return twos do the same thing. You don't have to have the core one, um, the base set, to load in your return two set. And you can also do the same thing with this little tooltip down here. And this actually applies to everything else as well. So when you click on this, a little, when you hover over them, a little explainer for each of them shows up, right? The top one's campaigns, the next one's standalone scenarios. You refresh to see all available items. And now you can see every campaign here. But the real trick about this tool is that you don't need to download the latest Super Complete Edition mod that gets released if you have a version with this. I had the previous version, which did not have Edge of the Earth on the table here. And when I click this, Edge of the Earth shows up in this list. And you can load campaigns that aren't in your current version of the mod through this interface. So if if you are behind on versions or you don't know, or if you think something new has come out and you're not sure, you can always check this and see if it's been implemented in the mod. There's extras, your tarot deck, your secret objectives and ultimatums, some encounter sets, all your investigators, and all of the community content, which um, don't use the scroll wheel here for some reason. I don't know if you can hear this. It's not moving at all, but you can just use this guy. A lot of fan content, a lot of fan investigators. So that's this general area. There's also some things in here that I'm going to get to later that are really handy, especially in the fan-made accessories, but this navigation overlay is quite good. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Next is over here, the upgraded cards. It's the same deal as the level 0 cards, but this time they're not just sorted by alphabetical, they're sorted by level and then alphabetical. So all of your level 1 cards, they say so in brackets next to the card as you hang it over, and they're also sorted alphabetically within each level skills, as events, assets, all of your multicolored cards are also showing up in here, and they'll show up in every class. So for example, if I go to Rogue, Old Shotgun is going to be in the Rogue display as well. So we'll just zoom out, fly down to the next area, which is right here, which is our weaknesses. If for any reason you need to access weaknesses, you can place them. They're sorted Dunwich Core, Carcosa, and Return next to it, Starter, Edge of the Earth, TFA, if you hover over the list, it's or if you hover over the um, the deck, it shows you which campaign it is. And then right here is a pile of every weakness. We also have the tarot deck, which was recent really recently released in uh, Return to uh, the Circle Undone. And there's also the tarot deck scripted, and I'll get into that one a bit later. Down here is the bonded cards, which come with a bunch of uh, cards that were released in, I believe, uh, The Circle Undone um, and Dream Eater Cycle, right here. And then we get into the play area. The play area is your victory display up here, 
Personally, I like to move the campaign guide off to the side or over in this area where there's actually nothing gets displayed out. The assets only tend to go to about here, so I like to I like to shove my campaign guide over there. So you've got your victory display, your set aside, your discard pile, your encounter deck, your agenda, your act, your scenario, your chaos bag. When you go to set up a scenario, a lot of this is going to get filled. And I'm just going to just show that really quickly right now to show you basically what happens. You click the place button, you get a box here in your set aside pile, your encounter deck's already built, your agenda deck's already built, your act deck's already built, your scenario card's there. On the first scenario of every campaign, you need to select your difficulty with the selector. Right now this is a 17 size chaos bag. Click standard, it's now a 16 size chaos bag. I can right click, click search, it shows me all the tokens in the bag, and they're sorted right now, but whenever you go to pull a token they come out randomly. You've also get your campaign log over here, and then down in this zone we have a in how many investigators are playing thing, and whenever you ha are hovering over a number like this, or like this, if it's something that's selectable, it'll come with that little red dot next to it. And in this case, you can click, right, uh, left click to tick it up, or right click to tick it down. Same deal with the doom up here, and same deal with the clues up here. Uh, sorry, excuse me. The clues on this one is actually clicking the button to remove clues from all your investigators. You start with your location there, and then each player mat. Your draw deck goes here, your discard pile will be here, your investigator goes there, and then you've got all of your slots, and all of these have snapping points so that when things come out, they go there. Whenever you're doing a chaos um, a skill test, you'll be clicking on this icon, so you'll left click once to pull a single icon, which is the elder sign, and then you can right, you can left click to clear the, that token and return it to the bag, or if for whatever reason, that was extraordinarily unlikely. If for whatever reason you need to pull more than one token, for example, if you're using Grotesque st uh, Statue from the core set, you right-click after the first token to pull another token. And you can do that with the whole Chaos Bag. And it just keeps going, right? And then at the end, left-click, it returns it all. So you can right-click, 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 right-click. And that's helpful. Uh, up here are things that I use usually for marking my actions. Um, they have states, which you can right-click and set, or you can just click a the number appropriate. So Guardian is 1, Seeker is 2, Rogue's 3, etc. Over here is all the tokens that you're going to need. Connection markers, to mark the connections that are connected, resource tokens, health, sanity, doom, clues. Personally, I like ticking these damage and horrors up to count how many damage and horror I have on me. And same with resources. Tick those up and down. Left click and right click to go up and down. There's also a nice trash can for anything that you don't currently need. You can drag into the trash can. There's a mythos button. This is also state based, so you can track what phase you're currently on. Above your token, uh, sorry, excuse me, above your token pools here, you've got your curse and bless manager, which I'll kind of get into the functionality of um, in in a more advanced section of the video. So after that, we're going to be looking over here at our investigators. So I'm just going to use the starter deck investigators for simplicity. Once again, you can download them from here, or you can download them from the corner here. Investigators. Refresh. Boom, there they are. I'll load in the core investigators as well, just to kind of show what that works as well. So we place the uh, investigators. For these investigators in particular, they come with their pile of all of their level 0 cards that they were released with, the weakness they come with, all their upgrades and then their signature cards and the insert that was sent with them. Now if you want to just play Nathaniel Cho's deck as it was packaged in the game, released on paper, boom, you're done. You drag and drop your weakness in, you pick it up by holding left click, you drag it over, and then when it's on there, R shuffles, and you're good. But, uh, and then this is the pile of upgrades from which to upgrade from. Randall and uh, Tommy are already in this deck. So that's kind of um, the gist of these characters. For the other sets of characters, it's a little different. Fantasy Flight publishes a list of a kind of a basic starter deck. And in the case of Wendy, um, she has 32 cards here. So that's 30 cards plus her signature weakness and her signature card. And she's missing her random basic weakness. So in order to play this deck, you do need to put in one random basic weakness. But you'll notice when you look through these decks, 
They tend to be kind of iffy. They don't have a lot of two ofs. You know, Switchblade is basically useless in her. This deck isn't really that good. You can play with it. You might have fun with it. But it's not a good deck. And so, personally, I don't re recommend playing with them. If you're very brand new, you can spend the time with those types of decks. Get a feel for the game. Learn the game just by, by doing. But you'll notice pretty quickly that they're not particularly effective. So that pretty much summarizes, summarizes the investigators. There's also promo investigators, which are like the unreleased ones. And there's a big stack of community investigators here. Um, all of different um, different things that, personally, I, I don't play with a lot of um, community-created player cards. I mostly play with community-created campaigns. Down here, we've got our new-to-the-game. Check the archives gun for how to play guide. Uh, we've got our <clears throat> excuse me, detailed phase reference guide, an alternate of that tracker that lets you see them as you hover over it, the, the, the detailed phases, your rules reference guide, and an index right next to it that you can look and see every single entry. If I want to see what happens at winning and losing, I simply hover over this. I can cycle through to page 22, or I can hover over this and type in 2-2, two, two, and that'll bring me to winning and losing. Anything you can... Um, Anything with multiple phases or states or pages like this, you can do that. Uh, if I just wanted to go to page two, I, I press two once and I wait a second, and it brings me there. So if there's a little bit of a delay. It, sometimes you'll like you'll click six and you'll be like, uh, oh, it didn't go. If you type another number too quickly, it'll just send you right to the end. So that also works with decks. If you want to draw one card, you can press one. If you want to draw 11 cards, you can press one, one. And sometimes you'll accidentally draw way too many. Now. This is probably the part you're all, you've all been waiting for, Arkham DB Deck Builder. Um, this is a really helpful tool. The big thing is that when you're first starting up, you're going to want to use Private here. And there's a couple of things you need to do in Arkham DB to get your deck list to import into this. So I'm going to open up Arkham DB really quickly. So there's a couple of things that you have to have done in Arkham DB to be able to upload your deck lists into this. First off, you need to go into Edit Account, and you need to have this checkbox listed. If you check this box, the view page of your decks will be public instead of private. You can link those to your friends. If you uncheck the box, all your decks become private immediately. If you do not have this checked, you cannot put your decks into the Arkham DB deck importer. And you also can't share them with your friends. So we'll go into my decks. I've got this Bob Jenkins on the road deck that I'm looking at. And this is the view website that it's talking about. If I tried to share this and I had that link unchecked, if I sent this list to someone, they could not see it. So the only thing that I need here of this deck that I've already built in Arkham DB is these numbers. I copy that. I come back to Tabletop Simulator. And depending on where I like to sit, personally, white is the first player, so that's what I like to do. Now, just for the purpose of demonstration, I am going to load in a second deck. And I'm just going to take this Roland Banks deck, because it's one at the top of my list right now. And I'm also going to load him in. So, I'm going to hide these in OBS so you can see what I've done. I've copied and pasted both of those URLs there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click this Build All button. And that builds my decks, all of them, the, all of the ones that I've loaded in here right now, object loaded. Cool. So when I scroll over here, my first spot was Bob. He's got his In the Thick of a Permanent over here. I personally like to pl click the L button to lock that to the table, so I can't move it if I wanted to. I can move these ones by left-clicking and dragging them. I can always take the top card of a deck by left-clicking it and dragging it really quickly. If I want to pick up the whole deck, I have to hold left-click, wait for it to pick up, and then you can do that. But you'll see there's this 33-card deck. It's got everything in there. There's his signature weakness. There's a signature card, and there's the random basic weakness that was put in on Arkham DB. And same deal. Over here is Roland. This is the parallel Roland, which is like a very complicated version of Roland. But I'll just uh, kind of splay the stuff out that he has here. Again, in the thick of it, he's got his 33-card deck. 
I like to do something like that and that, and then I'm all good to get playing, right? Okay, so that kind of handles most of the very basics I wanted to go over. Um, the next thing that I want to go over is like the getting set up to play, which I kind of already got started. But the way that you want to get a scenario a campaign started is you select one up here, you click the place button. You're going to get the scenarios here and you're going to get your campaign guide. The first thing you're going to want to do is look at your campaign guide, read your introduction, and do what it says here in the campaign setup. You choose your investigators, assemble your decks, choose your difficulty at that point. You can choose here on the select difficulty, I'll say standard. And now we're ready to get uh, set up because we've assembled our campaign bag. Go to the next page and then we get into the scenarios, right? So part one, the gathering. The second you see that, boom, place. We've already done that, that's fine. What's listed here is the description of the icons, what you're supposed to do with them, what you're supposed to set aside, what's supposed to go in play. For most scenarios, that's mostly handled. In some scenarios, it's not. And you do have to be careful about one po what pops out on the board and what pops out into your set-aside display. Personally, I like to just take my set-aside cards and shove them over here to make sure that there's nothing that's obviously wrong with what's going on. Now, personally, I've played this a bunch of times. I know the Ghoul Priest. I know these locations. I know Lita Chandler. It's not a big deal for the gathering. You need to shuffle your encounter deck because if you look at this, it's fully ordered. You will just draw these things in this order. You have to shuffle that. You cannot shuffle these decks. These come out in a specific order. Your Chaos Bag. I guess we'll shuffle that one time because we pulled so many Elder Signs earlier. And then you've got your tokens uh, explanations here for the tokens that are not numerical. And then you've got your agenda here, which is how many Doom before it advances. And your clue threshold here. You get your location and play. While you're doing the setup, you're supposed to technically follow the rules of the setup, which like spawns your guys in play. We'll go take a quick look at those. Where's the uh, scenario setup? It's right at the very end of this book, I believe. So we'll just kind of cycle back a little bit. Setting up the game, right? <clears throat> choose your investigators. Any trauma or damage or horror. We choose someone to be a lead. This is when you're supposed to do it before you've even started setting up the scenario, right? Shuffle your decks. Get your token pool and chaos bag ready. Take your five resources. Draw your opening hands. And then you read the scenario introduction in the campaign guide. So before we even see these decks, shuffle these sets together, we're supposed to have already shuffled our decks... And for the sake of this, we'd be drawing five cards for a mulligan. So I'm just going to click the number five here. Bam, there's my five cards. Weaknesses can't be in your opening hand, and you can do that. What I do, what I just did there was I dragged the top card really quickly with left click, and then I flipped it right as I was bringing it to my hand. And then over here on uh, Roland, we do the same thing. But since I'm not this player, I'm, I'm the white player, which is this seat. And I'll show you quickly what I mean by that. If I want to change my color, these are the different colors of the seats. When you join a multiplayer game, it's going to ask you which one you want to sit at, and you'll be that character. While I'm white, this is my hand. And so if I draw from this deck, they're going to get shoved over here. So these need to be in this hand. Now, a trick to playing two-handed is you go up into Options, you say Hands, and you just click Objects are not hidden in Hands. He also got his weakness, so we draw him one more card. So that's what you'd normally do. And, you know, I'm just going to say, yeah, fine, I'm happy with the cards in hand. Done, right? I don't know if I actually am, but that's what you do. And then you'd place your guys. You'd go ahead and you'd look at the setup. This would tell you to put each investigator in play at the study. You'd both enter the study. Maybe you'd read the flavor text if you're interested in that. And then when you flip that, based on the investigator's playing count that's set, a number of clues is going to spawn. Okay, now that we've got a scenario set up. I'm just going to rapid fire go through a bunch of different hotkeys to kind of remind everyone of what can be done, explain them, go over them for a second. Mouse controls. We already talked about that quite a bit. Left click is manipulating a lot of cards. If uh, There's a lot of snap points on the, on the table. So for example, when I'm putting these directives here, you'll see a little ghost hovering. And I'll zoom in to kind of show it a bit better. You'll see a ghost hovering underneath them. They're just going to snap right over to that when you drop them. Something you can do technically to circumvent that 
is while you're holding left click, you can right click, and that slams it right down hard onto the table. And if you let go of the left click, it puts it right where you put it. You just have to be careful to do it in the right order. That's all. So that's kind of your mouse controls. We already were over holding the middle mouse pans the screen around like this. Right click tilts you like this. Right click lets you look at all the options on any given thing, any any element. These ones that have the little red button, you just have to be on a spot that it won't be on the red button. So that's pretty much that. Uh, WASD also pans the screen around. W goes up, A over S, D. Pretty simple. Q and E rotate cards based on the rotation degrees you have set here. I have it set to 90, personally, I like that. So E taps it clockwise, Q taps it counterclockwise. R shuffles decks. R also rolls dice or flips coins. If you have dice or coins on the table, you can spawn those in objects, in components. You can get, you know, all sorts of standardized stuff, but dice specifically, plastic metal, whatever. You can spawn them, R will shuffle them. Another thing that I personally like to do, and I'll, this will kind of tie into the next rule, is say I have an effect that is making me randomly lose a card from my hand. I like to hold left to highlight multiple things. I have all of those selected right now. I can click F, that's the new one, is flip. But if I need to randomly discard, I have all these selected, I clicked F, I can click R to shuffle them, and then I just always discard this one on the, on the, on the side. And it would happen to be the beat cop, but the rest of these are in a different order. So that's a useful way to kind of get around um, that. Uh, another card, or excuse me, another hotkey that's very useful is group. You hold over these, Again, you select multiple things and you click the G button and it groups them together. Now another one that I just learned because I was kind of asking, soliciting for advice. Um, say I have all these in my hand and I'm dragging them around like this, right? I was just doing that a moment ago, but I want all of these cards. I select all of them, I lift them up. And then I want to put them into this group. I have all of them selected, I hover this and I click G and it shoves them all over together. And then similarly, if I, collect, if I select this group, like that, and I want to shuffle them into this deck, I can press R. Well, actually, if it shuffles multiple groups, that didn't do what I was hoping for. But if I click G, it'll put them in, and then I can shuffle it with R. One that you might be noticing is kind of annoying down here. My hand from the player that I'm currently selected as, that I'm currently set to, you can hide that if you click H. Personally, I like to do that when I'm playing two-handed, because it takes up quite a bit of a screen. That was one of the options we saw... Ooh. That was one of the options we saw in the configuration. Um, and I don't remember where that one was, but there's a hand minimized size here. So we'll put our hands back on. And now as we slide this, ooh, look. Oh, it's just barely showing, right? Little baby barely showing. But if you go like this, it pops back up. So a lot of people set that to like 50, just so you can see the titles. It's handy. But personally, I like to keep them all the way up and just hide it. As I explained before, if I wanted to draw a new opening hand, you know, put those on shuffle. I can type 5. I can type 1, 0 for 10, right? It's the different ways to draw from your deck. <clears throat> One that I'm not super familiar with, but the num numpad keys. 4 spawns damage. 5 spawns connectors. 6 spawns horror. 7 spawns doom. 8 spawns clues. 9 spawns resources. Very useful stuff. Personally, there tends to be enough tokens on the board that I just copy-paste. So hover over it, Control-C, Control-V. Right? And then when you want to get rid of them, you can just go like that. You can also cut and paste, which is a lot riskier because you can accidentally delete important things. And deleting tokens and stuff like that, you just hover over them, you select them, you click the delete button. You can also hold shift while pressing things to select multiple things. So for example... Uh, excuse me, control. You hold control while selecting things, and it selects them without having to do the drag and drop. But if you just go like this, you can select multiple components. You can pick up basically everything, right? Like, I'm just, I've got everything selected. If I click G, all of these would slam together. Um, and I'll just show you that with these, right? G, boom. Well, I was hovering over that when I did that. Didn't mean to do that. Now, I didn't mean to do that, so what I can do is up here, rewind time. <clears throat> 
And you'll have to forgive me because this is a very laggy thing to do, and I hate when I do it. I don't actually like doing this basically ever. But it does rewind, set you back to your basic zoom level, and it just undid me shuffling all those cards into that deck. So don't do this in your multiplayer games. <laughs> it's very frustrating, and it will fuck up people's things. It also can go back way farther than you intended it to. I didn't really intend to undo deleting those. So that's another thing to keep a uh, lookout for. Um, another thing that's useful to know is that when you're holding a card um, in your hand like this, left click, if I want to pick up another card underneath it, I just press T. Bring another card up. T. T. Right? Keeps just picking cards up. But um, if I want to drop cards, I hold Alt and click T. Like that. And you can even drop the last card. You can also do that with components. So let's just put a bunch of resources on the board. If for whatever reason I want to clean these resources up, oh, T, 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 T. My computer's going to start lagging because once I pick up about seven, it gets really choppy. <laughs> This is why I have a bunch of settings for uh, for my bad computer. But that's also a really useful one. I use that one a lot. Um, I think that that's mostly gotten everything. There's only one more that comes up very rarely, which is sliding cards underneath decks. Now, this one's really friggy, and it took me a while to get used to it. But you have to... You know how I showed you when I didn't want things to snap? I could right-click to shove them down on the board. Well, what you can do... So if I want this jury rig to be on the bottom, I can put it right here, put it down, and then slide it under. And it's, you can't just like, it's working a lot better than it used to for me, because I used to do this and it wouldn't, it just wouldn't go. But you can just slide it right under like that. That's a really useful uh, thing. Another thing that's really useful to know down here, this is less hotkeys, but more just useful stuff to know. This upkeep button does exactly what you think it shouldn't upkeep. Say, for example... I've got an opening. I've got a hand here. Uh, let's just like put that away. Say say that I've got like a heavy furs in play. I don't, nothing. None of this taps. So this is not going to be a very useful example. Let's 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 just grab my deck and find something that taps when I use it. Lonnie. So I've used her this turn to heal a damage off of my heavy furs. Let's just say, and I have no actions remaining because I'm using these to track my actions, and I'm at like three bucks, right? Let's just say that's where I'm at right now in the game. If I click this upkeep button for the end of the round, I get one resource, I draw one card, she stands, and these all reset. You can also copy and paste your action onto here to track things like Bob's bonus action. That's also very useful. I think that about summarizes it for hotkeys. And now I'm going to get into a couple of specific examples of things that have been implemented in the mod that will make your life a lot easier. So we're going to start off with the Curses and Clues interface, as well as the ceiling mechanic. So right here, I kind of talked about this earlier, and I said I'd get back to it. This is where we're managing our Curses and Blesses. The 10 Bless tokens that you have available to you are all listed, are all available in these pools, as are the 10 Curse tokens. And you can automatically add these or remove these from your bag using these add remove tokens. So if I want to add curses, bam, one just moved up there. Two, three, four. And it gives you a readout down here. And let's say I want to add some blesses. Bam, there we are. I've got four of each. Now, if I want to remove them one by one, I just click one to, once to remove. If I want to return them, there's none to return. The reason there's none to return is because take puts them out on the board. Now, it put it down here, which is super unfortunate. So if you want to do take, um, that's currently popping it in a really bad spot. But the point is, if these are just hovering out in the bag, out, out for no reason, right, the first one I took made it say three out of one, the next one said two out of two. If I click return, shoves one of them back, shoves another one back, okay? So that's how that works, generally speaking. I currently have them all in the bag. Let's just remove them all so we're back down to zero. And now I want to talk about ceiling, because a lot of the curse and bless mechanics are centered around ceiling. So say, for example, I play my two temp fates, right? And that adds one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? Or if I play to keep faith, right? That adds another four. Something like that, right? Favor of the moon. Pops into play. Right click it. Steal curse. However many you want to. One, two, three. Bam. They're there for you to spend. 
And when you want to use them, you, you tap that, you know, that's how the card works, and you say release. Right back to the bag. So this readout is giving me how many are in the bag, how many are on cards, not available from this pool, right? That's what it's giving me. Same, exact same thing with Favor of the Sun. One, two, three, release a token when you want to use it. So now I've got two there. Holy Spear, same deal. When you're doing attacks, you can release them and seal two, right? When you initiate this, <clears throat> excuse me, search the Chaos Token for two blesses, so you can just say seal two, bam, there they are, and you're doing your big attack, and when you want to use your little fight, you can release them. Unrelenting, same idea. When you commit this, you can right-click it. This one gives you the choice to seal three non-autofill tokens, right? So you can just, look, they're all here. Frost, autofill, tablet, cultist, skull, minus four. But here's the real trick. If I change that to an expert bag, uh, I, I thought this was supposed to update. Yeah, refresh seal options. There it is. Minus eight, minus six. So whenever you change your bag, you just need to click refresh seal options. Put it back to standard. <clears throat> refresh seal options. There's our stuff. So I'm just going to say the plus one and the two zeros, right? And that'll give me my two draws, right? And then you pull your token. Boom. You get a skull. You pass the test, whatever. Uh, didn't make me to click discard there. But the point is this can then release those tokens. And they're not sitting on it, unfortunately. So it kind of uh, janked up the how the functionality works. That's funny. I might have to do another take of this. Let's see if that works now. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so don't move this without re releasing them first, I guess. It's a good, a good lesson in how this works. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just drag these back to the bag for now. Shuffle that up. I believe that this messed up my counts um, because these are all off right now, right? Because what I did when I changed the bag up here, search, right? I've only got those ones that were sealed because when I was changing it to expert, it removed the ones that were in the bag. So if I want to go back my numbers down here to be zero, right? They're not counting correctly. I click reset. It resets them to zero. There's none in my bag again. So I went and fixed that thing that I messed up when I clicked that from expert to standard. So let's just kind of demonstrate that one more time. I'll just add them in. Refresh seal options. My blesses, my curses are all there, right? I pull my token, I return it. And then when I'm done with this, I click release tokens and then I can toss in my discard pile. The other thing is the cards that just go into play and stay in play. Your protective incantation can seal anything except for an auto fail. Read chaos bag. What does that do? Not sure. Anyways, presumably it's the same thing as the refresh that this had that this guy had. And you can just seal your minus one, and it just stays there. You just leave it there until until it's done. Shards of the Void, same deal. You can seal zeros, and then I don't think that this has the return functionality at the moment. But when you want to spend it, obviously you can just drag it back up, seal the seventh sign, same deal, seal the auto fail, release the the auto fail. So that kind of goes over sealing and blesses and curses. Another thing I said I'd revisit is the, the, uh, the tarot deck, which is scripted. Right click for card reading options. These are the options as described in the return to uh, the circle undone thing, the uh, insert. So chaos, boom, just gives you whatever, right? Random thing. And you have to read it. You have to zoom in and read it because when you click alt, it will flip it back to the correct orientation. You cannot just zoom in with alt. You do have to do this. Now, if you're zoomed in with Alt, you can hold Alt and press E and Q to rotate cards. But what that will do, if you've done that, right, if I rotate this to be upside down, now that I'm looking at this Keep Faith, it's also going to be upside down. So you have to be a little careful with that. You might you might end up in a spot where you've accidentally flipped something upside down you didn't mean to. So we'll put that back in. There's also Destiny. Boom. There's the cards that I believe this one... Is this the one that corresponds to... The circle undone? I don't think so. I think that that's just a random one. Anyways, those are those are a couple of different scripted options. Oh, I wasn't supposed to put those in as a unit. I was supposed to put them in individually. That's another important one not to forget if you're messing around with this. Um, balance. One, one face up, one face down. So those are all described in the return to uh, TCU insert, which will come out when you spawn in uh, the return to TCU bag and then place.
uh, well, I do have to recall all these first, right? If I click recall, it did leave this scenario on the board, so I'll just kind of scoot this stuff out of the way because I'm not going to be using this for, act for actual play. I like doing that because it kind of lumps them all together if you swirl your stuff around. Place. And here it is, right? And this will, this will describe what those do. There's also one thing I wanted to go over, which is scenario-specific tools. I believe Return, uh, sorry, Return of Wages of Sin should have something like that. And you'll see this has a more complicated setup than the ones we've done before. But for example, part of the setup for this is spawning heretics and putting them in certain locations. And there's also a randomization uh, element of certain levels, uh, certain areas. So when you're ready to do your setup, you simply click this setup button, boom, and it randomized which ones were there. And then finally, when you're at the point in the scenario, when the heretics come into play, spawn clues on heretics. Bam. Done. There's a lot of scenarios that have this, auto, this sort of thing automated. If you don't know what they do, you can always right click and see what this says. And furthermore, if you don't know what they do, you can just give it a go. And if it messes things up, control Z. I kind of talked about that earlier. And of course, it's going to gum up the recording while I'm doing this. But the point being is you can, you can undo it. Um, and if not, you can just start a fresh save. You know, not a big deal. A tip that's important for two-handed play, when you're using your upkeep button here on someone like Luke, who has a standard upkeep, gains them a card and a resource, when you're doing it with Patrice, it actually draws her um, five cards that she draws at the end of her turn, but you do have to discard first, and you have to be assigned to the correct color. So... I have to be orange when I do this two-handed, or if I'm going to play two-handed as white, I need to be sitting Patrice in this seat. Another thing that you're going to notice, and I guess I kind of stumbled into this one, is this overlay here, and I guess I'll just go talk about it right now. There's an interface up here, navigation overlay. I believe second, third, and fourth colors, uh, everyone that isn't white will come into play with this automatically open. This is the full table overlay, this is the play area overlay, and this is it closed. Now, the full table overlay, what is this? Well, it corresponds to each of the areas in the map, and it's just an auto zoom in to each of those places. Of course, it's not working for me for some reason, not quite sure why. There we go. Zooms into all the different places on the map for you. Personally, I quite like this tool. It's just that I like to drag my clues around, and this doesn't quite let you drag clues. Say I've got a clue here. I want to pick it up, and I want to drag it down to, to, my, to my map. What I do instead is I use these views, and I click Control-1. And now I have a saved camera port at this area. Say I've got... Um, sorry, I've been... I've been uh, making new games as my as my table gets very messy so I'll just I'll just place something again we'll just place the witching hour and we'll uh, we'll flip up some locations face up so they've got clues on them right if I'm at my loaded camera one and Luke discovers a clue I'm gonna set that as camera two control two I can say control or shift one to change between my cameras pick up a clue Shift 2 to change to this camera and drop it in the correct place. Now, a lot of people, you're going to go ahead and use your um, uh, 8 on the numpad to spawn new clues. And what you can do instead is just kind of move these ones to the side, click delete on them, go back to your guy, and then click 8 to put the clue on your board. An important thing about teardown of scenarios that I think a lot of people get into a bad habit of is you can just go ahead and delete these if you want, right? You shouldn't delete these. The reason being is that if you accidentally get into the habit of deleting everything here, um, you might have accidentally gone ahead and deleted something like the Tower or the Ace of Rods that need to be in your deck. Or if you're playing the Return 2 version, you might have deleted... Um, I'm not sure. There's, 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 there's various story rewards that you can get in scenarios or things you add to your deck after you've completed a scenario that if you just go ahead and click the delete button on all this stuff you might accidentally delete something you needed now you can reload it in through the campaign menu that's true but 
do you really want to have to go through the hassle of doing that? Not necessarily. So what I like to do instead is I like to bring all these things to the center. I like to click G on that one time. I delete all the tokens and I take all these and I drop them up in the set aside box. Once you've moved something at all down here or manipulated it on the board, when you click this recall button, it doesn't work anymore. So I haven't moved any of these. I haven't moved the set aside thing and I haven't moved the, ca uh, the campaign guide. Well, the campaign guide and the log come out with the, when I click this one up here, but all of the components for this scenario, once I started moving those uh, Witching Hour Arkham Woods locations around, it gets messed up. So I click recall now that they're in, back in the box and it all shoves back in and I'm ready to put in my next scenario. But watch what I mean. Once I move this office, if I click recall, um, is it, what, what, what's, the, what's the situation that does it? I'm gonna make a liar of myself. Anyways, the point being is once you've done enough stuff on the board, sometimes it just doesn't recall nicely. And you'll, you'll notice that once you play enough. Um, I think this is a bit more automated actually than I was expecting it to be. So anyways, that kind of summarizes that point. The last thing I wanted to go over is a couple of these fan-made accessories and what's available up in these like kind of somewhat hidden areas. Uh, like I said, you've got your token reserve, you've got Barkham Horror in here. Uh, if you're ever looking for Barkham Horror, it's this little kitty. Uh, you've got some leaked items, which is a couple of beta cards that have not actually been released or kind of like um, created on a live stream at one point. Whenever there's leaked materials that are not like fit for play yet, they kind of end up in here usually instead of up in the deck building areas. There's all the rule books and guides and stuff are in here. I'm going to search instead of dragging them out, but it's got your FAQ, your learn to play. It's even got some in-depth tutorials, some suggested ambient soundtracks, alternate play mat images, stuff like that. Taboo cards, if you open this one up, you'll have a bunch of taboo cards for each faction pop out. Now, I believe these are what are used if you build it from taboo out of Arkham DB. The one that I wanted to look at, though, was the fan-made accessories, because there's a couple of really cool things in here. So the first one is a hand, uh, hand size counter. And what this does, if we bring this down to our uh, Luke, if we put that right there, or we put it like here or something like that, and if we just keep drawing cards with him, it just keeps counting up. And it helps us remember how many cards we have in hand. Now, if you've got a card like Dream Enhancing Serum, and if you know what Dream Enhancing Serum does, it makes it so that duplicates in your hand don't count towards your hand size. So if I just keep drawing until I draw a duplicate, see I've got two knives now, right? It's going to tell me I have 14 cards in hand because I have Dream Enhancing Serum activated, and Dream Enhancing Serum doesn't count your duplicates. But I actually do have 15 cards. So whether you have this clicked, it'll tell you the, the exact amount, or you can hover it to tell you Dream Enhancing Serum amount, or you can click it, it'll always tell you the Dream Enhancing Serum amount, and you can hover it to tell you the not real amount. So we'll just head back up here. The next tool is um, some mini cards that are available. These are kind of handy. You've got little stands um, with characters on them. See, there's Roland Banks. You can uh, lift him up and use the uh, mouse wheel to rotate him. And you can change his states to uh, change his color. Personally, I don't use those ones very much, but they are kind of handy to use if you uh, find reading the bag uh, board a little tricky. We've got a choose your own adventure guide. Um, I believe these are made by anti Markovnikov. I've never personally used these either, but they're also a really neat tool um, to kind of change up how you're navigating through the campaign. These are custom play mats. I haven't used these ones before, but I believe they are thematically tied into each of the campaigns. We've got these stat counters, which if you're having a hard time counting what your current stat value is, you can... Um, use these bad boys. If you've got a lot of static boosts, I'll just pick these up. Come on. There we go. We'll head back down to Luke. So if I've got, say, like a whole bunch of things out, you know, I've got Holy Rosary. I've got Milan Christopher. I've got, I don't know, uh, a magnifying glass as well. And I'm going to take an investigate. I'm like, oh, I've got four. and oh, I've got five. Well, you can change the state of this to intellect. You can just tick that up to five, just to give yourself a nice reminder. Oh yeah, I've got five right now, and you know what? I've got five. I've got five willpower as well. These can be really useful for the investigators that have a very variable uh, stat pool. They can also be useful. I, I, I've used these before, um, just going like this. If I'm having a, if I'm playing on a rough night, you know, had a little bit too much to drink or something like that, 
Um, I like to use these to actually count up my stats on committing, just just so that I'm not fucking up math. I don't do it in videos very often, um, and I probably should for how often I sit there deliberating about uh, exactly how much I've committed and, or not. But you can kind of set these. You can use them for whatever you like. They're just a really handy little tool. Uh, the last one available in here is the Face Down Attachment Helper, which I'm going to go grab a couple of specific cards to kind of show off what this does. So there's a couple of cards in this game that basically make you put things into play face down underneath cards. And it can be really tricky to put stuff underneath cards. Like if I want to put something underneath Stefano here, it doesn't quite work as nicely as shuffling it into the deck did, right? I can't just slide it under. or It kind of like pushes her around and gets really friggy. So let's not do that. We pull out our face down help, uh, face down attachment helper. So the way Sephina works is instead of drawing your opening hand, you draw 13 cards, and you choose five of the events in your hand, up to five events in your hand, to place underneath her, and then you keep eight cards as your opening hand, right? So let's. This is just her, you know, her standard deck that she had there. So I type one three for 13 cards. It didn't work. I didn't type it incorrectly. There we go. So I accidentally had one more. So we'll just put that one away. So now we're looking for five events that we want to put underneath her that are not Painted World. She can't use Painted World on this. Painted World cannot be placed beneath her. So I've got a Daring Maneuver, I've got an Emergency Cash, I've got a Slight Hand, Drawn to the Flame, and a Sneak Attack. Cool, I at least got five, so that's nice. Um, so we're just going to put those underneath her. And what we can do is we can change our state to the Sephina state. Uh, that was not the Sephina state. The Sephina state, and we can just pop them on. One. Well, what does that say now? Daring Maneuver, level zero. Sleight of hand. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm not sure what those numbers actually are. I think it's the count of them. Oh, how much they cost. Got it. So this tells you what the five cards are. And when I want to go and play a card from underneath her, using a Painted World, or I want to go and choose an event beneath her and draw it, I just click the card, and boom. It pops up above it just slightly, and I can just drag it into my hand. So it's really useful. Um, and we'll just pop all those out. And that works for Sephina, that works for Diana, that works for Gloria, that works for the Crystallizer of Dreams, that works for Ancestral Knowledge, that works for the Astronomical Atlas. All those are pretty great cards, and they can be really friggy to make work if you don't have a tool like this helping you put the cards face down underneath them. Okay, so I was a little embarrassed that I'd never used this one before, and I, I want to give Minty Fan... Uh, proper credit for this and show what it does because a uh, minty fan's awesome she does a lot of uh, custom content and uh, she's great so what this does is it pops up a bunch of things up here for you to look at great you know we've got arkham knight of the zealot and a bunch of arkham locations these are not player boards these are actually locations available for us to change the player board behind us so these are really awesome um, there's a great diversity of art applied through these. A lot of it's taken right from the game. You know, great options for the dinner party scenario. There's a lot going on here that you can make lo uh, your games just to feel a lot more awesome and thematic. So I think that's a great tool. Uh, huge shout out to Ball and Mint Tea Fan. I hope I'm pronouncing Ball correctly. Um, this is a great tool, and I should be using this more often, to be honest with you. So that just about wraps up what I wanted to go over. Um, if you're a new player and there's anything that you don't know what to do, how to use the uh, how to use the program, feel free to drop a comment. If you're an existing player that does know how to do things and you have any corrections to add, please put in a comment. I would love to see some comment corrections in the uh, comment section to kind of correct how things should get used, uh, things that I kind of glossed over, if there's something that you think I missed. Absolutely feel free to chime in and let me know. And I can always just re-record a more uh, kind of organized version of this for new players. Um, I know that Jeff over on Winging It has a very good tutorial for if you're learning how to play. The only I was really only hoping to get across how to use the program here. I kind of assume you know how to play a little bit. And I can do a how to play tutorial someday, but I don't know that the way I do the videos would be very uh, tuned to it. And I kind of tend to meander and stumble over my words a lot, so I don't feel very comfortable um, doing a fresh play of The Gathering and trying to teach from scratch. But if people are really looking for that, and specifically on, uh, a learning video on Tabletop Simulator, I can do that. Throw a comment in the uh, 
in the comments there and I'll and I'll see what kind of interest there is. Anyways, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.